every three minutes, someone in the U.S. is diagnosed with a blood cancer, and millions of Americans are affected by blood diseases every year. A hematologist-oncologist is a physician who specializes in blood diseases and cancers like iron deficiency anemia, hemophilia, sickle cell disease, leukemia, and lymphoma. These physicians are trained in hematology, the study of blood and oncology, and today they'll tell us about the latest advances to fight these diseases on today's episode of CHS Presents, Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jane Hansen. Today's conversation, advancements in cancer care from the perspective of physicians who specialize in hematology and oncology. These experts focus on the treatment of blood cancers, including Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, leukemias, and multiple myelomas. A hematologist-oncologist may also specialize in the management of solid tumors, often working closely with colleagues from radiation oncology, surgery, radiology, and pathology. To speak more about advancements in treatment is Dr. Kathy Dang, who is a hematologist-oncologist from Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center, and Susan Santagata, a Good Samaritan Hospital patient. We thank both of you for being with us today, and we really appreciate your, your coming on board. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Dang, let's talk a little bit about your specialty, because you, of course, are the doctor for Susan. Yes. All right, so I am a hematologist and oncologist, and it's actually two separate fields that kind of have grown together. Um, so the oncology part of it, um, we treat all solid tumors. Uh, the most common ones are breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. And then the hematology aspect, hematology is actually split into two different types. We have malignant hematology, which are cancers that are blood cancers. So like you said, the leukemias, the lymphomas, multiple myeloma. But then there's this whole... Uh, other aspect of hematology, which is benign hematology, so all blood disorders that are not cancerous. And so uh, iron deficiency anemias, uh, low platelets, uh, sickle cell disease, uh, bleeding disorders, and clotting disorders. That's a huge area. Yes. How on earth do you do all of that? <laughs> So our training is in both. Um, historically, fellowships have been in hematology or oncology, but now all of the training programs in the United States have been combined. Why is that? So I think it's because that, you know, half of hematology is malignant hematology, is cancers, so then it's, it was lumped together with oncology. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So your connection with Susan, obviously, was the tumor, because she had breast cancer. Yes. yes. And so um, that's where you came into the picture. So I'm sure that Dr. Deng became a lifeboat for you of sorts, right? Oh, yes, of course, of course. Once I was diagnosed with the cancer, um, I, I went to go see Dr. Deng, and she just put out the plan for me. She just, this is what's going to be done. This, what ha this is what has to be done. And I was all for it, as long as I was going to get better. And they made me feel that that's what was going to happen. So the plan really is, it's like three different aspects, actually even four now, right, of what treatment can, for cancer can consist of? Yeah, yeah. So it's a lot. Um, so cancer care is usually split into three different uh, fields. You know, there's the surgery aspect, you know, removing tumors. There's radiation, um, which is almost like zapping the tumor with high-density x-rays. And then there's chemotherapy. You know, so I am a medical oncologist, so I handle the chemotherapy aspect of it. And chemotherapy is a very broad term that now also includes immunotherapy and oral medications. Which means that you get, you've had all of the above. I have. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about that experience? Because it just, I mean, it must have been overwhelming when you first started this whole process. It was very overwhelming. First finding out that you have cancer and then kind of, you know, having to process that and telling your family and then, um, and then going in to see your doctor and then saying, okay, you're going to do chemo. As shallow as it may seem or sound, 
all of a sudden you think of, oh my God, no more hair. Um, and that was a big deal for me. Yeah. May I just tell <clears throat> the audience that you just recently stopped wearing a wig? I did, made four days ago, I did. So it just felt right to take it off. And, and now it's kind of a rebirth, you know, here we go, we're starting life again and just go for it, mm -hmm. you know? But um, yeah, it's been a process. I, um, I guess the, the thought of what you guys go through, how do you figure out, because cancer's now become, cancer care has now become customized. Yes. Which is, a, I think, a huge development for you, right? Yeah, yeah. It has been a new advancement in the last five to 10 years, but especially in the last five years. Now, um, for instance, Susan's tumor um, is hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive, which is a marker that's overexpressed on the surface of the cancer cells. Now, so she gets, not only does she get traditional chemotherapy, which is what we usually think of, you know, that causes the nausea, that causes the hair loss, and causes the blood counts to go down, then she also needs medications that block HER2. You know, so she received two medications that block HER2, and she just finished those. Those medications are for an entire year, you know, every three weeks. And then now, um, you know, recently a new medication has, um, has been on the market that is a pill and also blocks HER2. So she's going on this medication as well. So she literally has seen everything. That's just amazing to me. And yet, um, don't you also have something that um, you can, with this kind of giving her this pill, that's really just aimed and tar very closely targeted? Yes, exactly. It's only targeted towards HER2, right. which is something that HER tumor expressed. Not all breast tumors express that. So can you do that in almost every kind of, of cancer these days when it comes to the the, the the oncology or the, the chemotherapy? Somewhat, yeah. We have a lot of targeted treatments in lung cancer now as well. Uh, we have specific mutations that can be seen on lung cancers. You know, uh, for instance, EGFR is a mutation that we see, ALK is a mutation that we see, and we have different oral medications that just target those mutations. Yeah. So the, the genomics of the tumor is so important now, you know, and so individualized. And that must mean that survival rates are clearly much Better. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So as you started through this process, um, what was the hardest part for you? Was it the surgery? Was it the chemo? Was it having to share the news? The hardest part was having to share the news and um, also facing <clears throat> all the treatments. Um, mm -hmm. But I have to say, it, it was very scary, but they, you know, Dr. Dang and all the nurses, and they just made everything seem like it was always going to be okay. So you just go through the process, and they help you through everything. They, it's like I've never seen Dr. Dang before in my life, or all the nurses, but they're like my best friends. They just made you feel like it's going to be okay, Sue, and you just just go through it. And they held your hand if you needed to have your hand held. And, you can call them in, you know, whenever you had a question. There's so much support that you don't even realize what you're going through is so bad, mm -hmm. to be honest. And so many different steps. Have, I, it's like, okay, I got through that, now it's this. A exactly right, exactly yeah. right. So I know you have four children. <clears throat> I do. And telling them must have been very difficult. It, it was very difficult telling them. Um, but I'm always a believer of, you know, letting them know what's going on. Because even though you may not think that they're going to help you, they, they really do. They don't even know that they're helping you. Just by keeping life normal, it, it's, it's a big help. You mean when they're complaining about dinner? Yes. And dinner. you just had a chemo treatment. Exactly. And it kind of makes you... It's like, okay, this is reality. You yeah. know, let's, let's continue. Yeah. So, you know, it, overall, it, it's, it's the best to have a house full of kids and of life and the dogs and the cats and whatever, you know, you just, it's just normal. And uh, when you're feeling down, you feel down, they let, you know, they leave me alone and then they pick you right back up. That's fantastic. We are gonna continue this conversation in just a moment. We're gonna take a quick break. Still to come, vaccines, symptoms, and the best way to prevent cancer. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Dang and with Susan Santagata. And um, again, thank you for being here. Now, Susan, question. Uh, we want to talk about the symptoms of cancer, but you didn't have any symptoms. No, I did not. You found your cancer from? A routine mammography. It must have been shocking. It was. I didn't expect it. No one ever expects it. But right. I, I felt great. So I was just, I thought I was just going in, getting my mammography, <coughs> excuse me, and then going back to work. Mm -hmm. So when, is this typical? Yes, very. You know, which is why mammograms are so important. Um, you know, women are notoriously bad at self breast exams. Even when we do them, we can barely feel anything. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you think you feel something and there's nothing there, you know. Um, so sometimes we say, you know, don't even bother, even though it is important. You know, but definitely a uh, yearly uh, visit to your either GYN or internist, you know, for a breast exam and then mammograms. Um, usually starting at the age of 40, um, it's, it's different for depending on family history. If you have a mother who was diagnosed at age 40, then your first mammogram should be at the age of 30. So it's really taking a good strong look at family history. Do you think we should even do them sooner? So it's hard for, for screening tests because you don't want to do too many because then you're going to get false positives and then false positives will lead to extra procedures that aren't necessary, mm -hmm. you know, so it's hard to say. Right, yeah. exactly. What about, are there any vaccines for cancer? So there is actually one vaccine that can prevent cancer and um, this is the vaccine that prevents cervical cancer. Um, it was it hasn't even been out for very long and actually recently um, the indication has been expanded um, so now women and men up to age 46 are eligible for this vaccine and previously I think the age cutoff was was 29 um, so and that's important and you're probably thinking why would men need a vaccine for cervical cancer right but this vaccine actually is against the virus that causes cervical cancer and can cause genital warts. You know, and this virus, um, HPV, human papilloma virus, mm -hmm. is sexually transmitted. You know, so it's, you know, men give it to women and then men also themselves can develop genital warts. So the vaccine is important for both men and women. And it is, you know, it does prevent cervical cancer without... But can it prevent any kind of cancers in, in men? No, no but it prevents the spread of the disease. Yeah, I remember, I think that my daughter had that at a very, don't you give it to teenagers now yes, or something? Yes, yes, okay. okay. exactly. Um, so what about the best ways to prevent it? Yeah, so like I said, mammogram, you know, is so important. And then the other screening that we do uh, that's important is colonoscopies. Mm -hmm. So everybody should have a colonoscopy when they turn 50. It should, be 50. Their, it should be their 50th birthday present to themselves. We talk about, you know, preventing cancer, but um, we've been talking a lot about tumors and breast cancer, but what about the blood cancers? Yeah, so um, the newer medications that we talked about, you know, immunotherapy, targeted oral medications, um, those have been playing a big role in uh, blood cancers as well. You know, for instance, um, CML uh, used to be a very aggressive disease, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. But now we have pills that people take, you know, once a day, twice a day, and it, you know, essentially gets rid of the disease so that people can live a normal life. You know, Just amazing. Yeah. Previously, it was almost a death sentence, you know, or people had to go through bone marrow transplants. You know, now it's just a pill. Yeah. And, you know, CLL, also another type of leukemia, which is chronic. You know, we have so many new medications for CLL that people are living longer and longer with these diseases. Mm -hmm. you know. is, there, is there more of it? Because sometimes, I know certainly the incidence of breast cancer, obviously, what is it, one in eight women or one in mm -hmm. seven women? Yeah, one in eight, yeah. One in eight. Um, will develop breast cancer over their lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, so is, are we seeing more and more of the blood cancers as well? Uh, I don't think so. I think that incidence has been pretty stable, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but treatments are getting better. So in the population, there are going to be more people with these diseases because they're living longer. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, when I first started doing stories about breast cancer many, many years ago, barely any woman who had it survived. Mm -hmm. And today the survival rate is outstanding and it almost is like I know so many women that have gone through the process that 
It's like, just like you said, you put one foot in front of the other and you do everything you need to do and then you go on and you live this normal, happy life with, most of them have better hair. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You just, you move on, you know. It, it, we're very lucky in, you know, to have all these new medicines and, and uh, ways of taking care of your cancer and it, we're just so lucky. We, you know, I don't even think anyone realizes it until you, uh, you're actually going through it. And because I had a mother-in-law too who, you know, who passed away from cancer. But, you know, there was, she didn't have the treatments that I've had. Mm -hmm. what, um, <clears throat> what, what do you think is, I know we talked a bit about telling your kids and that sort of thing, but as you go through the process, and for people that are, and women who are watching this in particular, who may get this kind of diagnosis, what kind of advice do you have for them about how to just mentally and psychologically deal with it? I'm going to say, first of all, to accept the help that all your family and friends are willing to give you. It, it's not easy to, especially when you're a go-getter and you like to do things on your own, it isn't easy to accept help from everybody. Um, but accept it and because it makes them feel like they're helping you. It makes them feel like they're participating in your recovery. And, that, and that's a big deal. And if you can accept that, you're, you'll go through the process a, a little bit easier. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a big, a big nut. You also talked to me earlier about the, the lack of stress from the job. Oh, yes, I am very fortunate. Um, I've had a jo I have a job that when I wasn't feeling well, I was able to stay home. Um, I always knew that my job was gonna be there. So the stress of not having to worry if you're gonna lose your job or not is enormous, enormous. So it, it let me take all my strength and, and put it into myself getting better and you know, not laying down in bed all day and getting up and it's like, today I'm going to work. Yeah, I mean, you went to work <clears throat> during the whole process, during the chemo, all of that. I mean, that's really incredible um, for, for somebody to do. I mean, isn't that, is that kind of rare? So we, we tell people that if they can, they absolutely should go to work because it will take their mind off their treatments. You know, being active will make you feel better. Otherwise, you're going to sit around at home and just constantly think about the cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so absolutely be as active as you can be. Yeah. Is exercise okay? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, you don't want to go overboard, but people should do what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, and nice walks and and all of that stuff. What about yeah. any other kinds of things that help, like meditation or, you know, things for the state of mind? All of these things help. Uh, you know, meditating, being mindful, being in the moment. You know, some people do yoga. The hospital um, offers these, like, chair yoga classes that patients can go to. Um, yeah, all, all of these things are, are great for, the, you know, the mind is just as important as the body. Mm -hmm. Well, I can only imagine. And in particular, I mean, you're a woman who's been caring for your kids. I know your husband died a few years ago. And I mean, just, I just think about what you've been through and how you've dealt with it. It's really amazing. Thank you. I, I, to me, it's, I guess my philosophy is just, you know, keep on going and try to stay as <clears throat> normal as possible. You know, just keep on going through life. Whatever life gives you, you take care of it and you keep on going. You can't give up. It's not an option. You may not do the things that you were doing before as quickly or, um, you know, but still stay with your routine. It may take you a week to do something that it only took you three days because you're tired, you know? So that's okay. Listen to your body, but don't let that fatigue take over. Yeah. You have to be in control. Yeah. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> exactly. We're going to take another break. But don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health.
Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. We're joined by Dr. Kathy Dang and Susan Santagata. And after the initial finding of cancer, it's important to have this whole team of doctors, right? But I know that what you have in your mind is is this kind of the tenets of oncology and how it works. And I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so this is something that I learned in residency and it's just stuck with me. And um, so I, I like to call it the four tenets of oncology. And so number one is it's not cancer until you prove it's cancer. You know, so that means you know, getting a biopsy. We have to know what it is and what we're dealing with. Number two, it's curable until we prove that it's not curable. You know, so sometimes cancers spread to other parts of the body, you know, and we have to show that. And so number three, even if it's not curable, it's still always treatable. And then lastly, number four, even if the cancer is no longer treatable, the patient is always treatable. And by that you mean that? We provide comfort care, you know, uh, pain medications, making sure people are comfortable, that they're breathing well. Uh, that they can spend time with their family, that they have good quality of life, you know, even if um, we can't treat the cancer anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you, um, when, you, when you bring, you know, included in the treatment, is there this, this, this thought all the time of families and having them be part of it? I mean, were your, was your family a part of, of all of this in the process? Yes, absolutely. They were m moral support and... <clears throat> Any um, any decisions I've had I had to make, we would discuss, and they just help you. And I'm assuming that that's a really significant part of the camp of what you provide at Good Samaritan. Yeah, absolutely. Having family support is so important, you know, mentally and physically. You know, someone to help you when you're tired, um, but also to be there for you, you know, when you're not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And could could you like call up and say, with any kind of an issue, any kind of a I feel this funny thing today, or I'm really feeling down. Can you, is there other resources for you to get that kind of help on a daily basis? Absolutely. If it's not the uh, Dr. Deng's office, it could be um, good, some good Sam themselves. Um, there's a whole team of, of nurses that you can call them at any time. They actually call you mm -hmm. to make sure that you're okay, you know, um, which was amazing. Every Twice a month, I would get a phone call, say, Susan, are you okay? Do you need anything? You know, how are you feeling? You want to get your nails done? We'll let <laughs> you know where to go. I mean, it was a complete, they just made you feel loved. That, yeah. It's very important. And with, and especially when you're going through all of this to have, a, it's almost like a normalcy to it. Exactly. You want your nails done. Exactly. The little tiny things probably made a huge difference. Sure. So to anybody who's got a family member that may have just gotten some sort of a diagnosis, what would you tell them to do for that, for someone they love to help them in the process? Just stick to the, you know, with that, with that person. Just, you know, be their friend and be there. Don't let anything change. Don't let the routine change. Just um, be an ear for them. Um, give them a hug um, and just hold their hand. It's very simple, as you know. Um, I think the the mentality of it all is is very important. You you have to have a great attitude, and you need people with positive attitude around you. And you clearly have one right here in I Dr. Do. Dang. I do, Dr. Dang. I'm is sure you're amazing. grateful for her every day for the work that she does, and we're so grateful to you for sharing your story. Thank you. So thank you. Best of luck to you and keep up the good work. Thank you. As always, for more information or to schedule an appointment at one of Catholic Health Service's six outstanding hospitals, you can call 1-855-CHS-4500 or visit chsli.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jane Hansen, wishing you goodbye and good health.